What do you get if you combine these three things? Minecraft, a game I love and have poured countless hours into. Two, how to bootstrap test automation and how to do it visually and fun. And three, Henrik Nyberg, one of my first sources for inspiration and knowledge regarding Agile and Scrum. Henrik is a co-founder of Go Climate, author of Scrum and XP from the Trenches and many other appreciated books and publications. And we both worked together for many years, both at Spotify, but also as members of CRISP. So if you combine Minecraft, test automation and Nyberg, you get today's lightning talk. Take it away, Henrik. So yeah, I was invited to talk a little bit about uh, what we've been doing at Mojang with, uh, with uh, test automation. So just about the last year or two, we've been uh, exploring this a little bit and uh, kind of accidentally invented a little framework that we call the game test framework. So I'm going to talk about uh, how we came to do that and kind of what we learned from it and uh, maybe give you some, some tips that might be useful in your context. So here goes. Here is the spoiler alert. <laughs> this is what it looks like. And the rest of the presentation is going to be kind of explaining what the heck is going on in this picture. Minecraft is a pretty well-known game, but for those who haven't played it, uh, it looks pretty simple. You got these kind of ugly, blocky graphics and this kind of procedurally generated world. And you wouldn't think that this is something terribly complex to test. But there's this thing in there called the player. And uh, players complicate things because they, they do things. Uh, they build the world. Everything in Minecraft is pretty much generated by the player, other than when the world is default generated from the beginning. So players build stuff, and we have no idea what the heck they're going to do. So how do we know if our stuff works? How do we know that we didn't just break something? It gets even crazier when you look at things like, like, like tech. I mean, we have a lot of technical players. This is my, my friend who built something he calls the, the Sky Farm. This massive, big, automated contraption high up in the sky. And <laughs> just, just, just to give you an example, this is an automatic uh, sheep shearing machine. So here we have sheep being sheared and then uh, the wool gets sorted automatically in this bunch of hoppers over there. And then they get ended up in different chests. And then if you want, you know, orange or red or yellow, whatever wool, you can go pick it up. This is by many standards, a fairly simple machine. You can see even more crazy complex machines. This is a, <laughs> some kind of walking machine that someone built and uh, yeah, again, we have no idea what the heck people are going to do. So how can we test that stuff actually works? That was our challenge. And of course, we don't, <laughs> we don't always succeed with it either. So we do create a lot of bugs. We have uh, at last count earlier this week, 7,028 bugs in just the Java edition of the game. This is all in our op open bug tracker. And uh, yeah, we create a lot of bugs. Some of them are unavoidable, of course, but some would be possible to do something about actually. Not all of them are really important. Like for example, this one, wolves in minecarts difficulty seeing skeletons. So you put a wolf inside a minecart and then, uh, then it can't see a skeleton under certain conditions. Like, okay, how important is that? I don't know. But more importantly, how could we possibly predict that this would be a problem? We basically can't. So yes, a lot of these bugs are unavoidable. It's just kind of uh, the, the price you pay for building an open world game. Um, but how does it happen? And <laughs> from a developer perspective, right? This is, let's say, me coding along. I build my feature, right? Uh, I test the feature I just built, obviously. And unless I'm in a terrible hurry, I would also test a few related things that I might have broken, right? The obvious things. Let's say I fiddled with minecarts. I might test minecart related things just to see that it didn't break something. However, this last step, test like hundreds or thousands of completely unrelated things just in case I happen to break something completely unexpected. Obviously, I'm not going to do that manually. It's just, it's, it's unrealistic. But this is where the bugs happen. Uh, almost inevitably, when we fix one bug, we create another bug and we just had no idea that that, that, that would happen. So yeah, that's what I mean by, ha by you know, some bugs being just unavoidable. But we can't always hide behind that excuse, right? Saying that, oh yeah, bugs happen, it's unavoidable. Some bugs are unnecessary. They shouldn't really happen. Like, for example, this one. This is a, a very silly example. My carts cannot traverse corners. This happened about a year ago, I think. So suddenly, this very basic thing, a minecart in Minecraft could not turn corners on a rail. 
pretty obvious thing would have been really easy to, to, to notice if we had just tested. But of course, whoever created that bug accidentally was probably working on something completely different and had no idea that this could have any effect on, on, on minecarts. So this happens all the time. And the kind of question in our minds was, can we, can we automate this? I mean, can we automate some of the more obvious tests such as, such as these? And all right, a little bit about testing in general. Most, most code bases nowadays use unit testing to some extent. And unit testing basically means, you know, you write code to test code. So up here we have um, a string util test that just checks, you know, can we truncate strings in the correct way and add three dots when necessary, etc. cetera. Um, they normally run very fast. Uh, they're quite easy to write, but they're very narrow in scope. They only test this one little thing. So connecting that to some wider behavior, such as minecarts traveling on a track, is, is really hard. Um, you could write higher level tests like this one, you know, like too low health should cause death. Uh, so if I hurt the chicken, it should after a while die. I could maybe write a unit test for that, but it's still pretty far from that to actual real testing. Like all the tests might pass and I still might have a chicken that just doesn't die for some reason. Who knows, right? So you, you can't really get away from manual testing also. Manual testing, of course, is a lot slower. You, you're doing it manually, uh, but you get broader tests. You can, you can, you know, be more, you can improvise and, and try things that you didn't plan to test from the beginning. And you might notice bugs that you weren't even testing for. Like, why the heck did that water suddenly turn green? Right? So manual testing is still important, but there's this gap in between. This is like, can we do something that is, you know, has a wider, coverage than just a unit test, but yet can be automated. This is what we, what we wanted to, to explore. Um, so we, we set out some kind of high level goals, like what, you know, if we had a really good test framework, what, what would that look like other than just unit tests? And this is pretty generic. This is nothing specific to Minecraft. It's just, you know, what is a good test framework in general? They need to be super easy to write. They need to be super easy to read and it needs to be really easy, easy to run the tests because Face it, we developers are lazy. If it's not easy to use, we won't use it because we'll be busy doing the next thing. So dead simple is really important. And um, no manual setup, that's, that's part of dead simple. It should just be, you know, one click essentially, and then you should run. I shouldn't have to install stuff and fiddle around. And in our case, we wanted the test to be executed in an actual Minecraft world because that's where we see problems. Not running in some, you know, simulator or some local little, like, uh, uh, local environment of some sort. It should run in actual game. And um, a test should be quiet when successful and should be verbose on failure. So if they succeed, I don't want to hear. I just want to know it all succeeded, spare the details. But if something goes wrong, I want every detail that I could possibly find. And visibility, it should be really clear. I should be able to watch the tests as they execute so I can see where did it go wrong? What actually happened? I don't want to just have a report coming in afterwards. But I also want to be able to run them invisibly. For example, on a build server, if I commit my code, uh, I don't want to have to do something manually. I just want to find out via Slack or something that, hey, you, you, you broke this test. So both visible when, I'm run, when running it myself and invisible when, when running them automatically. Scalable, I should be able to have hundreds of these tests without getting bogged down. And uh, yeah, I think that was pretty much the definition of awesome. So this is what we wanted to achieve. And unfortunately, we couldn't find any existing test framework that did this for us, mainly because of the, uh, this third point here, we want to run inside Minecraft. And as a, as a general tip, when, when making a framework and you don't know where to start, and this happens a lot in games, I worked a lot with game companies and people kind of get frozen up. They're like, no, no, this, this is very visual. How can we test this? So our game is special, our game is different. There's a lot of multi-threading, I, I don't know. So it's going to be really hard to test. Well, here's, here's a tip. Start by thinking about how do you test manually, right? Use this as a starting point. So th that, that's what we did here. Let's say the, the case of the, the, the mine cart that couldn't turn corners, right? Whenever we have a problem, we build some kind of test harness. This is what we do all the time. We build up some kind of structure in Minecraft to, to replicate the bug, for example. And then we do something to that structure. In this case, I press a button and then the cart moves. And then I observe and, and check that what happened should happen. So this is the basic skeleton of any kind of testing framework anywhere. Manually, this is what we do. So, okay, let's use that as a kind of a template, right? We want to do this, but automatically. And it's the first bit that's hard, right? I mean, I want to, I want to automatically build this 
track and this card. And then I want to do something to it and then check that it worked as expected. Point two and three are quite easy to automate. Point two is just pressing a button. Point three is asserting the position of the cart. But building the test harness, if I do that using code, <laughs> it, gets, it gets pretty icky, right? This might be an example, right? I'm, I'm placing blocks in certain coordinates. And this is a dead simple structure. Imagine something a little bit more, more, more you know, a little bit bigger. It would get really hard to understand what am I looking at here in this code? Did I even get it right? If something broke, why did it break? What, was, what, what, what should it have looked like? So even if, you, even if you clean this up and shorten it a little bit and use loops and reuse, reuse code, it's still a pile of code. And normal humans cannot look at that pile of code and see the structure in front of them. So that's when we had this flash of insight. Like, wait a sec, why should we build structures using code when we can build structures using the game? I mean, that's what the game is optimized for. This is what you know, players do, even like a four-year-old knows how to build stuff in Minecraft. It's optimized to be easy to do. So that was kind of the, the, the big aha. We should build our test structures using Minecraft and then we should write code to, to test against them. Uh, so here, here's an example of, of, a, of a test structure, a little more complex one. This is a mob, uh, a villager trying to find its way through fire and we don't want it to burn, right? So it walks through the maze and it tries to pass pathfinder around the fire. And there's lots of weird things that can happen. The villager could cut corners, which is a typical optimization thing they do, and then get too close to the fire, etc. So uh, they can be really complex, these structures, or they can be really simple. It, it depends. There is something in Minecraft called a structure block. So you can build a structure and then kind of save it, export it to file. So we use that, that mechanism here. So each test is its own isolated structure that you can then save and export. All right, so example. Let's say I wanted to do this uh, cart turning the, uh, on, on a rail thing, right? So the first thing I do is I create a test structure. And we have, this, we have some, some utilities for that. You can type basically, you know, slash test uh, create. And then boom, you have this, this kind of platform. And then you basically build your little structure on it. It takes like two minutes. It's, it's really quick. And next, I got to write some code. So we created a, a very lightweight framework with, with a helper class. And using that helper class, you can basically operate on your structure. So as long as your structure that you created is named the same as your, as your test function, in this case, cart tests and turn, as long as the names match, they will find each other, right? The test framework will automatically make them find each other. It'll automatically find and generate the structure that I created manually. And then it'll, in this case, press the button at coordinate 031 and then wait until the my cart arrives in the right position. Um, and uh, since all coordinates are relative, it's quite easy. I'm operating in this local kind of microcosm of a, of a Minecraft world. Um, so this is a, an example of a very simple test. And surprisingly, the tests that we write are often you know, kind of this simple, maybe five or six lines of code. And that's also really important, right? That was one of the, you know, uh, design goals that it should be really easy for anyone to read and write. Even if you, even if you don't program, you should be able to read and understand kind of what, what's going on. So step two is of course to run the test. And we do that just by typing a command, just say run this test or, you know, run all tests or maybe run all tests that are related to minecarts, right? And uh, if it succeeds, we get this beacon. I think we, beacon is this green, um, uh, laser-like thing uh, uh, that, that's up to the right. And beacons are nice in Minecraft. Um, it's, it's an already existing block. So none of these blocks that you see are new for the framework. They're just existing blocks that are already there. Beacons are highly, are visible from, from very long range. So that's why it's nice to be able to get a high level picture of like which of these, you know, 400 tests failed, right? Look for the red beacon. So green is success and a red is failure. And as I mentioned, we want tests to be kind of quiet when successful and, and very noisy when failed. So in this case, I get error messages all over the place, right? Uh, the beacon, of course, to show me that there is an error over here. And when I go close, I can see uh, a, uh, an, an overlay, right? Showing the location of the failure. The minecart should have been over there and it's not, so that's wrong. And even uh, uh, there's, there's a lectern over here with, with a book on it. And you can click on the book and, and it'll tell you also details. So we kind of use the Minecraft world itself. And that's nice because then you can save the world, look at it later, and most of this information is still there. If I want to rerun the test, just to check what, what happened, why did it stop there? I can just press, press, press the right button on that structure and then boom, it's going to regenerate, reset the test, and then run the thing again. So you can really easily kind of repeat the test to find out what went wrong. Also useful when you're actually debugging the problem, right? You change some code, run the test again, change the code again, run the test. It's just a very effective way of working. 
So as I mentioned before, normally as developers, before we made this framework, when you wanted to test stuff, you would build your own little structure and test something manually. And then that structure is forgotten and gone later on. So all developers have their own pile of temporary single use test structures that then get thrown away. So a lot of waste. Um, and this helps us kind of reuse stuff. So that, that's, that's the last bit. Um, I built the structure, I wrote the, the test code, I ran it and I, I made it work. Now I want to share this with my team. So I type an export command and what it basically does is turn this structure into um, code. Or in this case, uh, uh, a, 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 a uh, custom data format that we use. So this is the code that, that, I, that I don't have to write. I don't, even, I don't even have to look at it, right? Uh, it generates that code. And why do we do that? Well, because we want to store it in the version control system right? Because tests are also to be version controlled. So both the test function itself and the test structure are in the version control system, which means anybody can run the tests. We can run them on the build server and we're, we're all going to be running the same tests. So very, very convenient. And another key thing uh, is about scaling, right? We don't want to have to sit and wait. Um, unit tests tend to be really fast. These kind of tests can take longer, right? Especially like the villager who's trying to make its way through the fire maze. That could take maybe 10 seconds. And if every test takes 10 seconds and we have 300 tests, well, yeah, we don't want that. So we could basically just run them in parallel. Um, here's a, here's a, a one minute demo movie, all right? This is what it looks like when you run all the tests at the same time. And this happens every time we, we, we make a pull request and kind of submit code. So it runs all the tests. And again, green bar is success. Now fast forwarding a little bit, I'm flying through. Um, <laughs> A lot of these tests looks kind of the same. That's because we can reuse, we can take a structure and then through code modify it just a little bit to make like 50 different variants of one type of test. So we're testing machines, we're testing minecarts, we're testing mob behaviors, we're testing all kinds of crazy stuff. And just adding gradually as we go. So there's no you know, rule that as a developer you have to write tests. It is voluntary. But the framework is designed to make it simple so that people will want to run tests. And increasingly more, uh, increasingly often, uh, developers are doing it. Not not everybody, but more and more people are doing it, and, and that's actually uh, enough. Also, test frameworks tend to be kind of viral. Once you get it working, then people see it and they catch on. They're like, "Hey, that was practical. You know, this automated test just caught a bug for me. Maybe I should write more of them." Right? So it's kind of catching on. But it took about maybe half a year or a year before it really started catching on. So now we have about three, four hundred tests like this. So uh, as I mentioned, headless mode. Um, a test framework it needs to be automated. Like the running of it has to happen automatically. We can't rely on developers remembering to run the tests, right? We need both, trigger it manually and be able to run on a server. So in our case, uh, what that does is that the server will create a new empty world, run all tests in parallel uh, with some exceptions, like some tests conflict a little bit, right? Like some tests require daytime in Minecraft, others require nighttime. So we can't run those at the same time. So they get kind of batched up into different batches. But other than that, it is actually in parallel everything. Um, and if something fails, then, then of course the build fails. We, we toggle some tests to required equals false if they're kind of flaky, or maybe it's a known bug that we choose to live with for now, but we still want to kind of visualize that the bug exists. So those tests can be toggled to required equals false. And what basically happens then is uh, they show up as a failure, but the, it's, it's an orange bar instead of a red bar. So you see it failed, but it's not gonna block the build. Um, yeah, and if, if things fail, you can, of course, afterwards examine that, that saved world and see why, why did it fail on the, on the server. Right? Okay, so um, after about a few months of iterating on this, we got to a point where pretty much every point got fulfilled. It's really easy to write and read and run tests. Uh, there's no manual setup at all needed as a developer. They're executed in Minecraft. You can watch them, them ex execute. Quite a success, verbal self failure. Uh, very visible when working in the dev environment and invisible on the build server and scalable. You can have hundreds of tests running kind of at, at the same time. That whole test suite I showed you takes about two minutes uh, to, to run through. So typical usage patterns, how do we use this? Um, well, I guess the most common is probably when debugging. So I hear about a bug, create a test structure to repeat the bug, then fix it. And the nice thing about that is I can easily create lots of variants of that test structure to test the different edge cases and things like that. So often you can fix more than one bug at a time uh, when you do that. It's an alert system. It makes sure that the bug I fixed stays fixed because it's quite common for bugs to kind of, you know, come back and haunt you later on. 
typically because that part of the code was a little bit shaky from the beginning. So until we clean that code up, tests are likely to sometimes come back. So this kind of helps us avoid that. Um, the tests help us detect surprising side effects. Like I had no idea that this might happen. I had no idea that my code would impact that subsystem. Um, it's also a learning system. Like if I'm wondering how does redstone work in Minecraft, actually, I can run all the redstone tests and it'll just a bunch of crazy contraptions, how they look like and how they're expected to work, including known bugs. So yeah, it's quite useful for that. And a test driven development is something uh, we don't use very often, but when we use it, this is highly, uh, this framework helps a lot. So basically before making a, a new feature or a new change to a feature, create a test first and that test should fail. To, and that demonstrates the need for the feature. And that failing test becomes like a really strong focusing like uh, tool when you're developing the feature. So next step, make the test green, make it pass using whatever you know, hack fix you, you can, just get it working. And then the third step is refactor. And while you're refactoring and cleaning up the code and making the design good, that test is used to help you notice if you have to break things again, right? So good old test driven development. Um, this kind of tool makes that kind of realistic to do you know, also for actual features. All right, um, what about the future then? We developed this about one and a half years ago. And uh, of course, keep adding tests and sometimes updating or removing old tests. This is just like any code needs to be maintained. Then we have some maybes. We hope maybe someday to make a cross-platform version. Right now, uh, there's two different editions of Minecraft, Java edition and Bedrock edition. They run on kind of different platforms and there are for historical reasons, different code bases written in different programming languages. So right now, those two frameworks, those two code bases have different test frameworks. It would be really nice to unify that. We'll see. Um, and it would be very nice to open up the framework. Right now, unfortunately, it is an internal tool. We use it for our own productivity. Ideally, we would be able to open this up to our community. So when they submit bug reports, they could attach an actual failing test. That would make life so much easier. But I'm not sure if we'll get there. Uh, I hope so. But it takes a bit of time to figure out how to make this open. And of course, we need to think about how we spend our time and how important that is compared to say, you know, developing more features in the game, right? So yeah, that's kind of some possible futures for this framework. But again, nothing here is set in stone. Uh, right, I'm gonna wrap it up just with some kind of things that, that, that I've learned along the way and that might be useful to you if you work also with uh, software development. Um, I've learned not only here, but in many other contexts that test automation can be done almost anywhere. I often see like teams kind of limit themselves mentally by saying, well, we can't, we can't test automate because we are doing games or because we are doing real time systems or embedded software or, you know, insert excuse here, right? Most likely that's not true. Most likely you can automate if you really want to. You might not be able to automate everything effectively, but you probably don't need to either, right? Just shift the mindset from we can't because to how can we? Right? Let's, let's figure this out. And practical tips. Definition of awesome is very useful. Like, you know, what would an awesome framework look like for us, right? I gave you my list. Maybe your list is a little different. And then start simple. Don't make this grand design for how you're going to fulfill every point. Just set that as a vision and then take small steps towards that over time. And of course, use existing frameworks. Don't reinvent the wheel, right? But most existing frameworks are optimized for things like web development and apps. And if you are very much you know, in a very different domain, you'll need to use different tools and they might not already exist. So use as much tools that already exist as possible, but don't be limited by it, right? Just because that perfect tool doesn't exist, don't be limited by it, build it yourself. It's probably gonna be worth it. In our case, it definitely was worth it. And, and accept that some things are hard to automate and maybe not always worth it, at least not as a first step, right? For example, a rendering in a game. We don't automate, you know, the like, does the sky have the right color, right? Uh, no, that we have to test manually. Although you could, of course, automate some aspects of it, right? You could run a game, you could script a playthrough of a game, save screenshots of clips automatically, and then you can manually look at those and see if something looks off, right? So then you can kind of get a little bit of, of the best of both worlds. So yeah, be creative, I guess. But um, yeah, I guess that's about it. So this is just uh, some of what we've been doing in Minecraft and test automation, and I hope some of it was... Uh, useful to you. Thank you so much, Henrik. That was so inspirational. Uh, I'm a uh, old developer myself, uh, advocate for uh, test automation. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, true. 
and I'm a passionate Minecraft gamer. So this, this, uh, yeah, this brought a big <laughs> one. This, this brought a big smile to myself, to my, to my face. Uh, thank you for taking the time. I have a few follow-up questions out of curiosity. Yeah. On, the, on several occasions, you use the phrase, "We create bugs." What, what, hey. why, why do you show those wordings? There's other ways to look at it. Um, well, it's true, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> But it's also a little bit tongue in cheek. I mean, of course, we're not trying to create bugs. We're trying to make features, but bugs come with the, the kind of, it's, it's, it's included in the package. <laughs> and I also like to emphasize that it's worth the price sometimes. For example, if we were deathly afraid of making bugs, we would, the game would be a lot worse. So I think context comes in play. This is a game, right? If it breaks, you know, okay, some kids will cry. <laughs> Some grown-ups maybe too. <laughs> At one point I heard you gave, gave an example of a bug you, or several bugs actually, you intentionally left in as, as a feature. Yeah, well, first of all, there's that too. Some bugs are actually good bugs, right? They're, they make the game more fun. Because um, quality, I mean, is, is, is subjective, right? As a user, sometimes a bug will just make it more interesting. Uh, you can hide in a composter by jumping into it and closing a lid on top of yourself. And then now you get forced into a crawling position. That was not by design. That's a bug, but it's hilarious. So we, so we keep it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you also described, well, judging from your talk, at least, it, I get the sense that you spend a lot of time uh, building this framework. When have you spent too much time? How, how much time is worth spending on the test automation framework? And when have you crossed that line? Uh, I guess that's two questions. One was how long it took, another is when, it, when you spent too much time. What's funny is it might look like it, we spent a lot of time on it, but we actually haven't. It was surprisingly fast. It was basically me doing this on the side. Um, there was never any point where we put this on our roadmap to make a test framework. It's just that I got annoyed as a feature developer myself. Why the heck are we making these bugs that are, could have been automated? And I, and I started just goofing around and then showing to my colleagues and then they seemed inspired by it. So that gave me energy to keep fiddling with it. Yeah. So it was surprisingly little effort, but I guess in our case, that's because we had mostly components already, right? We have this building tool called Minecraft, right? <laughs> and a visualization tool also called Minecraft. So it was really just a matter of connecting, connecting the dots. Yeah. But back to the other question, like when in some other context, it may be really, really hard, right? Really a, a lot of work. So there is a limit, I guess, where it's not worth it. Um, I would say start looking at, or maybe even measuring how much time you spend on manual testing. Mm. And also start measuring, or at least estimating, how many bugs that you spend time fixing. How long time are you spending chasing them down and fixing them? And how many percent of those bugs might you have found automatically with the test framework? And mm -hmm. just kind of do the math. <laughs> and you'll probably conclude that, you know what, this is actually worth spending a significant amount of time doing. Plus, you don't need to do it all at once. You can maybe just automate the most important 10% of your tests, the ones that, the ones that are easy to automate and hard to do manually. Just those. And you have this wonderful 80-20 rule, right? And afterwards, you can decide, do we want to keep improving the framework or, or stop here? So you don't need to kind of jump in the deep end and just make a huge investment and then hope for the best. Just start in small steps. Thank you. Um, it's easy to, to be carried away and get inspired by this, the visuals of Minecraft. Uh, <laughs> not everyone works at the, in that kind of environment, uh, but do, would you happen to have any inspirational examples from other kinds of set up administrative systems or um, I don't know. So I'll admit Minecraft is unusually entertaining in that sense, watching those tests run. <laughs> I would say the same of any kind of game, but I don't know. I, I've, I've done a lot of test automation stuff in the past and maybe I'm just easily amused, but I actually get a big kick watching the logs. Just look, it's doing all these things that I don't have to do myself. Oh, look, a web interface popped up. Oh, it's filling in stuff for me. Um, or even just unit tests, seeing the green bars, right? Um, yeah. Maybe it's just me, but I, I find that really, it just, it's just inspiring to see. Um, I but of course, it's not going to be the same uh, entertainment factor as, as in a game. That's, I guess, unavoidable. Yeah. Uh, one last question. You made a super exciting journey in your career, I guess. Uh, developer for many, many years, discovered Scrum and Agile, became a world-renowned Agile speaker, talker, coach. Now you're back to as a developer and uh, what's a circle. a circle or maybe a sinus curve, <laughs> yeah. we'll see. But what have you, I'm curious, what have you learned or relearned or rediscovered now that you're kind of back in the coding trenches? Um, 
it's super interesting, actually. The reason why I did it was because I started feeling that it was getting old, the coaching stuff. I don't mind doing coaching, but doing it full-time, I felt that it was just too much of the same. After a while, I started recognizing things, started getting too familiar. Um, I wasn't feeling <laughs> challenged in the same sense. But also variation, right? Do something for 10 years, do something a little different. Plus, in my case, I like coding. I like building stuff. It's just part of my nature, right? That's, I'm always looking for excuses to, to tinker. So, so that's when I kind of realized that, oh, coaching to me is, is just a tool, right? I, I want to have a well-working environment. I want to have a focus on aligning the team and an inspiring vision to work against. But that's just a tool, right? That, that's not what gets me up in the morning. Uh, I want all that stuff there so that I can build a good product with my team, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of why I gravitated back towards development. But actually what I did was I spent, like my, my, my role now is partly still coaching because we have a fast growing team and there's still some coaching going on in that organization. But a good part of my time is spent developing and designing. In fact, probably the majority of my time is designing and developing. And although I've done development for, for many years, design is a little bit new to me. And in, in the Minecraft team, we combine these roles. We don't have designers that don't code. If you're a designer, you're also building the features that you design. And that's to me a fascinating role. So I'm really learning a lot about kind of the design process and how do we, you know, like make really cool features in short time and iterate on that and get feedback and pretty much practice what we've been preaching all these years. <laughs> but I would say one thing, one thing that has struck me kind of coming from the perspective of a coach and then joining a team as a designer and developer is coaching is scary, right? I mean, with, as a coach, you never know if you're doing something good. It's really hard, right? I, I'm running a workshop. Are people learning and enjoying and, and solving problems? Or are they just bored to tears hoping the workshop can end so they can go back to work, right? <laughs> There's yeah. always that, that doubt as, as a coach. Um, and, and what I've learned is be really humble as a coach because you have these great ideas in your mind, but if you're not actually in there building the product, a good number of your ideas are not going to work in practice. Mm. Just, just, just realize that, right? It's still okay to test them, but you need the humility to realize that your idea might not be as good as it sounds when it comes to doing it in practice. Uh, really important. I've, there's a lot of things I've learned that I would have, like, like in the past, for example, I was very much against uh, branching of code as, as, a, as a coach, right? Because yeah. I've just seen all the pitfalls you fall into. It's better to use just one branch. Everyone commits to main and then use feature flags. I saw a lot of that at Spotify when we worked together. So that was kind of my mindset is branching bad, feature toggles good. Now I'm in a team, we do a lot of branching. And if some coach would come to tell me, would come and tell me that, you know what, you shouldn't do that, it's bad. I would probably just give them a punch in the nose, right? Because <laughs> I mean, we're using the tools that work best for us yes. uh, in this context. Yeah. So obviously we can improve, right? We're not doing things perfectly, but there are no black and white truths. And as a coach, we sometimes fall into that very comfortable illusion that there are black and white truths, right? Yeah. Thank you, Henrik, for joining us as a guest uh, and presenter and well, having this uh, talk with me on, my, on this YouTube show. Cool. Thanks for inviting me. Super nice to have you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I hope you're as inspired as I am by this talk. But I'm looking for even more inspiration. If you have any inspirational tips on blogs, books, uh, articles or, or videos here on YouTube regarding test automation and how to make it visually and fun. Please share them with me and everyone else in the comments below. And that's that for this time. But I'm always striving to make this channel more fun and enjoyable. So if you have any feedback on what you want to see more of or less of, well, help me improve this channel. And let's continue to explore, have fun, and be safe.